Hey there, folks. It's John Scalzi, and I have a special treat for you today because I know how much you enjoy special treats. Uh, and the special treat for today is I'm going to read you an abridged version of Judge Sin Goes Golfing. This is a short story which I recently released as a chapbook through Subterranean Press. Uh, the version that you're about to hear is the version that I performed when I was on tour uh, and when I read it in public. It's adapted slightly. It's shorter. Uh, it's also uh, got a lot of the really bad words taken out of it because when you're in a public place, you don't want to be screaming profanities at the top of your lungs, strangely enough. In any event, I hope you enjoy it, and if you do like it and would like to check out the full version, remember that it is available as a chapbook through Subterranean Press. And without further ado, here we go. Judge Sin Goes Golfing. Judge Sin's assassination was getting in the way of his golf game. It was just that sort of day. Judge Bufin Nigginson had been reamed into consciousness at 5 a.m. by his alarm clock, which whacked him on the head with its little arms. Get up! Get up! Get up! Get up! It exclaimed. Sin swung at it and missed. The clock's adaptive evasive programming had learned this trick. It also avoided the heavy tome of recent significant common confederation court rulings which was then flung at it. Sin finally stood, wobbly. The clock came up to him and squeezed one of his legs in a hug. Now you're up, it said. Sin kicked it mightily and gained satisfaction as it fragmented against the wall. It was programmed to do that, too, and after a couple of seconds it began pulling itself together, humming as it did so, while Sin staggered off to the shower. The mobile alarm clock had been a gag gift from one of Sin's clerks, who had confused Sin's sarcastic nature with Sin having a sense of humor about himself. The clerk learned of his misapprehension when Sin fired him. However, Sin had to admit it actually did get his ass up in the mornings, especially when he woke early for his weekly golf pilgrimage. Twenty minutes, one shower, and one hangover pill later, Sin was out the door and into the cab of his crappy Ford. Good morning, the Ford said in its customary greeting. Suck it, Sin said in his. The Ford, neither intelligent nor programmed for complex emotional modeling, accepted the greeting without complaint. Where will we be going today? it asked. Dulles Woods Municipal Golf Course, Sin said. All right, said the Ford. It should take us forty minutes to reach Dulles Woods Municipal Golf Course. Shut up and drive, Sin said, and leaned back into his seat as the Ford pulled out of his garage and headed for the sixty-six. Sin hated Dulles Woods Municipal Golf Course with a passion that smoldered like a trash fire. Dulles Woods was built on tarmac and graft, the former provided by the portion of the old Dulles International Airport upon which Dulles Woods was placed, and the latter by Loudoun County supervisors who built the course using rigged single-bid contracts to friends and relatives. During their fraud trials, it was discovered that the runway paving had never been torn up, and only a thin layer of topsoil had been placed on it, which explained how Dulles Woods could be simultaneously patchy and swampy. It was also discovered that Lee Amsterdam, the allegedly celebrated course designer, had no previous course design experience. Under oath, he revealed the course was designed by taking holes from a PlayStation-era Tiger Woods video game. Poorly designed, dingy, and ill-kept, Dulles Woods was the veritable ass end of golf. Sin believed it was, in fact, the worst golf course east of the Mississippi, and only his certain knowledge of the existence of God's Love Creationism Golf Course and Museum outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, complete with scripture-bellowing caddies to throw off one's game, kept Dulles Woods from taking the crown for the whole of the United States. And even then it was a close call. God's love had a sweet par four sixth hole, marred only by the dinosaur-riding caveman sculpture on the fairway edge, which seemed like a holy magnet for golf balls. Sin hit the sculpture three times in three rounds. After the third time, Sin's caddy muttered something about predestination. Sin then exercised free will by clobbering the caddy with his driver. This earned the caddy a comfortable settlement and Sin a lifetime expulsion from God's love. It was not the first time Sin had this happen. 
Indeed, this was why Sin found himself grimly trooping toward Virginia in the first place. Dulles Woods was a crap hole of a course, all right, but it was also the only golf course in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area that Sin had not been banned from. Every other course had made it known to Sin that despite his fame and acclaim as a fast-rising star in the judicial community, his temper made him persona non grata. Basically, Sin was a jerk, and never more so than when on the fairway. Sin stood in his car, letting it steer itself down the 66-267 interchange, recalling each expulsion in turn. At Rock Creek, he got into a philosophical argument with an appeals court judge that ended with Sin chasing his fellow jurist around the fifth hole green, his putter swinging like a cudgel. On the red course of Army-Navy, and after a few too many pre-game whiskey sours, he told the U.S. Chief of Staff just how many war crimes the Admiral ought to have been hauled up for over the last decade. At Bethesda, he'd vomited into the punch bowl during a fundraiser for a local congressional representative. Sin argued that this shouldn't get him banned from the course, just the clubhouse, but to no avail. At Raspberry Falls, he insisted on playing a round of golf while a local charity ran a petting zoo on the grounds. A particularly solid tee shot brained a runaway lamb that had wandered onto the fairway. The lamb braining and sin subsequent and profane tirade over the corpse of the wee fluffy animal took place in full view of six horrified youngsters, including the grandson of the governor of Virginia. He told his dad, who told his dad, who called Sin, who called the governor a Virginia ham. That was that for Raspberry Falls. Eventually, private clubs Sin had never even been to had made it known to their members that he was not to be invited. When Sin first heard of this, he had stumped in the office of his lawyer and demanded to sue. On what grounds, David Stern, his lawyer, had asked? Racial discrimination, Sin said. Are the clubs banning other non-humans from golfing at their clubs? Stern asked. No, Sin admitted. And they're not banning other rig, Stern said, naming Sin's particular species. No, Sin said. So it's really just about you, Stern said. That's not racial discrimination. That's Buffen Negan Sin discrimination, and that's entirely legal. Well, there's got to be something you can do, Sin had said. Not really, but there's something you can do, Stern said. Stop being such a jerk when you golf. You're fired, Sin said. Stern sighed. Look, he said, I don't mind that you're a jerk on the links. I make a good living preparing your settlements. It keeps my paralegals busy. But this really is just about you. There's no legal relief when people don't want you on their private property because you are a jerk. You just have to stop being a jerk. Sin mulled this. Public courses. They can't ban me preemptively, he said. No, they can't, Stern agreed. You're free to golf on any public course until you do something disruptive and stupid. Then I won't do anything disruptive and stupid, Sin said. Good, Stern said. I'll tell my paralegals they can have the afternoon off. Six months and two settlements later, there was no public course within driving distance of Washington, D.C., where Sin was allowed to golf, except Dulles Woods. Long abandoned by any golfer who could choose not to golf there, Dulles Woods was the golf course of last resort, populated by duffers who, like Sin, found themselves banned elsewhere. At Dulles Woods, Sin found a measure of peace. He was not the worst-tempered golfer there by a long drive. In fact, Sin could recall watching two members of a foursome in front of him getting tasered by Loudoun County sheriffs for assaulting each other and then resisting arrest. Sin had never once been tasered. He felt pride in his relative social advancement. Sin's Ford rolled into Dulles Woods' weedy parking lot six minutes prior to tea time. Sin got his clubs and made his way to the automated check-in. It charged Sin an outrageous amount to play on the course, because the course knew its golfers couldn't golf anywhere else, otherwise they would. Sin clicked his mouthpieces in irritation and headed to the cart rental. Dulles Woods had only three carts for rental on a good day, and two of them had issues. Sin hoped the good one had not been rented. It hadn't. 
Sometime in the night, someone had stolen its fuel cell and the fuel cells of the other carts as well. Somewhere on Route 7, a crappy car was chugging into work on a jury-rigged power source. Sin swore and stomped around the back of the automated check-in where the illegal caddies hung out. At some point along the way, it had become known to the locals that Dulles Woods golf carts were unreliable and that the course's golfers, while foul-tempered and occasionally abusive, would also pay a day's wage not to have to carry their own clubs. Thus, every morning, the local unemployed lined up behind the automated check-in. Dulles Woods didn't sanction the caddies, but by and large it let them be because it discovered a way to monetize them. It simply ruled that no one could walk the fairways without paying fees. The golfer who used the caddies ended up paying two greens fees plus whatever they paid their caddies. There was a reason why Dulles Woods had only three golf carts, two of which were always in serious disrepair. Usually there were four or five caddies hanging around. This morning Sin found only one. Where's Ivan? Sin asked the guy. Ivan was a recent immigrant from Russia who Sin preferred because he knew enough to shut up and stay out of Sin's way. The guy shrugged. I haven't seen anyone else, he said. Sin allowed himself a brief moment to wonder if Ivan was okay, and then reminded himself that the two had not made some sort of lifetime commitment to each other. Well, come on, Sin said to the new guy. The two went around the front of the check-in, where Sin paid the caddy's fees, shoved his bag into the guy's arms, and then stomped off in the direction of the course. The first hole at Dulles Woods was inspired by the same hole on the old course at St. Andrews, a 376-yard par-4 with a small water hazard bordering the green. But where St. Andrews had the venerable Swilkin Burn, Dulles Woods had a plastic-lined ditch filled with mosquitoes and mats of algae. Sin placed his tee and his ball, called for his driver, and then angrily snatched it from the bag when the caddy apparently couldn't read the number right there on the damn head. Sin cleared his thoughts, visualized where he wanted the ball to go, and took a mighty swing. The ball took off from the tee like a shot, lofted in the air like a dizzy, trembling quail, and then landed gorgeously, beautifully, and perfectly, just where Sin had wanted it to go, precisely positioned for the approach to the green. Sin stood there, stunned. He turned to his caddy. Did you see that shot? he asked. The caddy shrugged. Sin jammed the driver back into the bag, irritated, and tromped off down the fairway. The simple fact was that despite his love of golf, Judge Beefen Nigan Sin was bad at it. He was, in fact, historically bad at it. Sin's two-decade affair with the sport of golf, begun in the first year of his posting on Earth, when that first metallic ping of the ball meeting metal resonated inside of him with a nearly sexual intensity, had been one of aggravation and futility. Sin had been a persistent sewer, wooing the sport with a series of lessons and seminars, new and improved clubs, heads, shafts, and grips, and endless variations of the golf ball, all promising better, smoother flight characteristics and accuracy off the club head. The sport was not moved. Indeed, the sport was spiteful. After two decades, Sin still held the maximum handicap for his sex and species allowed by the USGA. Tim Pratt, the golf pro he'd hired some years back to improve his game, tried to explain to Sin why it was unlikely he was going to get much better. Your body's just not designed for golf, Tim had said, and pointed to Sin's arms. Your limbs aren't as strong as human arms are, and they don't have the same freedom of movement. We can improve your game a little, but you're never going to get your handicap down to something that humans have. Well, Bertab Chapoy plays without a handicap, Sin said. Poy is the greatest Whig golf player ever, Tim said. You, on the other hand, are a middle-aged judge with a bad swing. Let's try to keep a sense of perspective. Where's your sense of perspective now, Pratt, Sin wondered, as the ball lifted from the fairway and sailed, smooth and silky, to land on the green mere yards from the cup. It was a rhetorical question. Tim Pratt was dead, a victim of putting into holes he'd been best advised to steer clear of and having been shot by a jealous husband because of it. 
but the essence of the question was relevant, Sin thought, as he chipped his ball into the hole and took out his scorecard to mark off the first birdie in his long, frustrating personal history of the sport. Golf, heretofore a reluctant mistress, had suddenly, and quite unexpectedly, let him get her top off. What it was, Sin realized, as he went par for the next two holes and registered another birdie on the fourth hole, was Dulles Woods itself. Sin had been forced to learn every hateful nook and cranny of this fetid course. Every boggy fairway, every scummed over water hazard, every sand trap infested with cat feces and raccoon corpses. His knowledge of this one crappy course was, in its way, as extensive as his knowledge of common confederation law, and perhaps even greater since he did not revisit the same laws every single week like he revisited the links here. Dulles Woods, in all its feculent glory, had steeped into him, into every orifice and pore and spicule, until it had become part of him, like a skin tab or an intestinal polyp. Existential skin tab or not, as Sin conquered the course, maintaining an even and satisfying par, he felt something lift from his soul, something that he would not have been able to name until this very game of golf, a secret feeling of personal inadequacy. Sin had risen above his lower class station on the Wurgian colony of Fului to become one of the most influential Wurg jurists in the common confederation. It was true that a posting on earth wasn't very noteworthy in itself. It was one of the lower tier judicial postings. But it was here on earth, on this little backwater planet, that Sin had decided Nidu v. United Nations of Earth, a sovereignty ruling on a newly discovered manufactured sentient species. That ruling did something almost unheard of in a legal system that had existed for tens of thousands of years. It opened up an entire new branch of law. Sin had become a legal sensation and had capitalized on it shamelessly. He was still stuck on Earth, but if the whispers were to be believed, Sin was being considered a dark horse candidate for the Common Confederation Executive Court, the High Castle, as it was informally known, when two of the eleven seats were to open through mandatory retirements later in the year. But for all the fame and notoriety that Sin had heaped upon him, and which he had enthusiastically shoveled on himself, in his small and compact heart were dark questions of his fundamental worthiness, in itself the wellspring of his ambition and attitude. Through force of will, Sin had beaten back every challenge to his competence and ability, until that fateful day more than twenty years back, when he first stepped up to a tee, swung his club, had the club fly out of his hands and strike the senior member of his foursome, knocking the man unconscious and into the hospital for six stitches and overnight observation. Golf had ever defeated him, ever mocked him, ever reminded him that all his competence and flair for the law, all the fame and notoriety that accrued because of it, was but a thin, sweet candy shell over a dark and bitter liqueur of inadequacy. Golf would not let Sin forget that, fundamentally, he sucked. As Sin recorded another miraculous birdie, he realized now how this constant reminder of his failures had poisoned him over the years. He now knew why he fired his clerks at the slightest whim. He now understood why none of his three marriages lasted more than a single breathing cycle. He realized why it was his children had been sullen during their court-ordered visitations and cut off all communication when they had become adults. And, most of all, now he comprehended why he had to be banned from every other golf course in the Washington, D.C. area. Because, in the end, Dulles Woods, crappy, inadequate Dulles Woods, was not only a golf course, but a map of the abscessed topography of his own soul. And so it was, there on the eleventh hull of Dulles Woods, copped from Pebble Beach, with the ocean view replaced by a view of the ground traffic snarled up on Route 28, that Judge Buffin Negenson experienced a shock of personal enlightenment as profound as any experienced by any sentient creature ever. It was like Saul on the road to Damascus, Buddha under the mangrove tree, Kukigo trawling for croons at the shore of the Shaden Sea, 
or the Grinch discovering his heart grew three sizes that day. Sin saw with crystal clarity the flaws in his makeup and the places where he was being healed by this miraculous and epic round of golf, this gift to himself, accomplished only through complete understanding and pointing the way for his personal redemption. That this moment happened with a Titleist Forge 695 MB7 iron in his hand, in the presence of a disaffected caddy, on a course that smelled of decomposing tar and deer urine, mattered not in the least. As Sin carded the eleventh hole, par, he knew he had been given the opportunity to remake his life. On the twelfth hole, one over, he vowed to make amends to those he had treated ill over the course of his career as a common confederation judge. On the thirteenth hole, par, he became determined to apologize to his wives for being cold and distant during their marriages. He swore to mend relations with his children and earn the love he'd withheld from them and that they now withheld from him. On the fourteenth hole, par, he decided that he would tip the caddy, even though the fellow was pretty damn useless. And on the fifteenth hole, birdie, he knew that he must become an advocate not only of the law but of justice, and must use his position as judge to effect that change, to become the engine that powered the whole of the common confederation into a better era. It was in this haze of self-redemption and spiritual rehabilitation that Sin came to what he knew would be the greatest challenge in his personal journey to wellness, Dulles Wood's infamous 16th hole. It was the 16th hole, as it happened, that revealed course designer Lee Amsterdam had his head well up his fraudulent ass. Bored with nicking fairways and greens from a video game, Amsterdam designed one hole by himself based on a favorite miniature golf hole. It was a boa constrictor of a fairway that curved back on itself, featured immense grassy hills at each curve intended, Amsterdam said, to ricochet balls off of, and a series of hooked water traps that turned the fairway into a near impassable maze. At 890 yards, it was not the longest hole in the history of golf, but it was definitely the most poorly designed. USGA regulations did not recognize pars of more than six, but most golfers at Dulles Woods were happy if they managed to card an eight on the hole, cursing Amsterdam as they did so. As if to reflect its shame, the 16th hole was a slogging walk from the 15th hole and from the rest of the course, isolated inside a deep collect of fast-growing pine that edged onto the fairway itself. Rumor had it that enough drivers, irons, and putters had been flung into the pines over the years that an ambitious person might collect several complete sets of clubs. Sin turned to his caddy as they stepped up to the tee. Hand me the driver. No, that one, he said. The caddy handed over the club. Sin set his tee and collected his thoughts. Sin had never gotten out of the sixteenth hole of Dulles Woods with anything less than a fifteen. Sin had never gotten out of the sixteenth hole of Dulles Woods with anything less than a fifteen, a non opal bogey, as one of his playing partners dubbed it, and had never left the sixteenth hole without feeling like he had either wanted a drink or to fire someone. But not today, Sin thought. Today was a day of science and magic. Sin knew where to hit the ball to land it on the fairway at just the right spot to make a diagonal shot through the back track. Then just the right speed, angle, and iron would lift it over the water maze. From there, a short shot onto the green, and then a solid putt into the cup. Five strokes for a birdie on the hole. He could see it. He could imagine it. And today, of all days, he knew he could do it. With a supreme confidence that he had never before felt on any golf course, Sin swung back and prepared to deliver his mighty redemptive shot. After Sin had tumbled to the ground, he spent the next few seconds trying to reconstruct what the hell had just happened. At the top of his swing, Sin felt his golf club wrenching itself from his grip as if a cruel and capricious god had flicked it away. Sin spun awkwardly backwards, spreading one of his wrists as he automatically reached out to hold back the planet that was swinging itself toward him. Sin heard a gasping sound to the right. Still prone, he looked over and saw his caddy was on the ground, rocking back and forth and clutching his neck with his hand. 
Blood was filling the spaces between his fingers and dripping slowly to the ground. Sin crawled over to his caddy and placed his own hand on the man's hand. Let me look, he said. His caddy didn't respond, but allowed Sin to move his hand. As he did, something small and flat fell the short distance to the ground. A deformed bullet. Son of a bitch, Sin said. Now it made sense. Someone shot at him, hit his club instead, and the ricochet hit the poor bastard caddy in the neck. You're all right, Sin said to the caddy. It's just a flesh wound. The caddy groaned and lost consciousness just as a spray of dirt pelted them both. Whoever shot at Sin was still doing it. Sin crawled back away from the caddy, dragging his fallen bag of clubs with him as a shield. There was a whine as another bullet whistled by, and several others cracked overhead. Sin hunkered down and felt an emotion well up inside of him. Not fear, but another emotion entirely. Pure rage. Presently a man-shaped shadow covered Sin. He looked up to see a wild-haired young human male pointing a handgun at him. The gun was shaking a bit. Judge Buffeniganson, I sentence you to death, the man said. The quaver in his voice enraged Sin even more. He was clearly being assassinated by an amateur. You moron, Sin said. Can't you see I'm in the middle of my round? The young man paused, uncertain. Judge Buffeniganson, he started again. Sin waved him into silence. I heard that part already, Sin said. Why are you trying to kill me? I was getting to that, the guy snapped. You interrupted me. Oh, well, I apologize, Sin said. So sorry to put you off your schedule. The man blinked and swallowed. Clearly, this assassination was not going as planned. Judge Buffeniganson, I sentence you to death because of the crime you committed against the planet Earth in the Lawson ruling, he said. Lawson, Sin asked, incredulous. Lawson v. Abernethy had been a basic land rights case where there had been a potential conflict between UNE law and common confederation statutes. Sin had overruled the UNA ruling, but sent it back to the lower court with new instructions. He'd placed a stay on implementing the ruling until the lower court had a chance to take it up again. Good God, man, there's not a thing in Lawson that's worth killing me over, Sin said, and then pointed at his unconscious caddy. Hell, there's nothing in Lawson worth killing him over, either, and I'm damn sure there's nothing in Lawson worth keeping me from playing this round of golf. Lawson wasn't just about land rights, it was about the environment, the man said, and then stopped. Sin waited somewhat impatiently, and kept waiting until the point that the man coughed, drooled blood out of his mouth, and pitched forward dead. Sin saw a red splotch on the back of the man's shirt. Someone had shot him in the back. Sin dived back down behind his golf bag, but then peered over it a few seconds later. The assassin was another man, this one somewhat more professional-looking than the unkempt previous assassin. This one walked toward the tee purposefully, scoped rifle cradled in his arms. Sin wondered why someone with a sighted rifle would bother closing in on him, then figured it out. Like the first assassin, this one had a message to deliver before he killed Sin. He'd intentionally shot the first guy in order to make sure Sin wasn't killed before he had an opportunity to deliver his spiel. The second shot intentionally missed Sin to keep him contained until this new assassin could get to him. Screw this, Sin said, and stood up. If this new assassin was waiting to kill him in order to deliver a spiel, Sin was damned if he was going to hear it on the ground. The assassin trained his rifle on Sin, but held his fire. The assassin was intent enough on keeping Sin in his rifle sights that he was not aware that some thirty yards behind him, another man had emerged out of the pines to the right, his own rifle in hand, trained on the second assassin. Sin, in spite of himself and against all sense, pointed at the new guy and shouted at the second assassin to look out. Even more incredibly, the second assassin listened, turning just in time to catch a bullet in the arm from the third assassin. The second assassin's rifle fell to the ground, but he remained standing, reaching into his waistband to pull out a handgun, which he trained on the third assassin, thereby missing the appearance of a fourth man who materialized out of the pines to the left of Sin.
With his own automatic rifle, this new threat stitched the second assassin's back, neck, and head full of metal. The second assassin slumped, and the two remaining assassins began shooting at each other across the length of the fairway. Sin stared, agog, too stunned to move, watching the two men shoot and run, run and shoot. Finally, a thought struck Sin. Crap, they're coming right at me. Sin dove back down to the ground. Running wasn't an option. Sin didn't want to present a target. He had no idea if either of these two planned to monologue him before offing him. On the ground, Sin searched around for the handgun the first assassin had trained on him low those many seconds ago. He found it, grabbed it, and checked the gun's magazine. It was empty. Sin's vision clouded with rage. That little turd had wasted his ammo and had held an empty gun on him. Sin could have killed him. All other thoughts were delayed as Sin looked up and saw that his two new assassins were making a beeline toward him. Both the assassins had long dropped their guns, having expended all their ammunition trying to hit each other and failing. Whichever of the two was going to kill him was going to do it up close. Sin grabbed his golf bag and heaved it in their general direction, extracting the three wood as he did so. Ten seconds later, Sin and the two assassins each had a golf club in hand and were eyeing each other warily. Look, Sin said, after a minute of everyone not moving, all I want to do is play this hole. One of the assassins, brown-haired, where the other was blonde, grinned at this. Oh, that's nice, he said. You have four people trying to kill you at the same time, and you're thinking about your golf game. Yes, Sin said, and was stunned to hear the utter sincerity in his voice. I need to finish this hole. It's important. Hey, sorry, the blonde assassin said. There are other people on the course by now. I don't have time to let you finish your round. But why, Sin said. What have I done to piss you off? It's not personal, the blonde said. I got thrown this gig the other day. Well, whatever you're being paid, I'll match it, Sin said. I need to finish this round. It doesn't work like that, the blonde said. And anyway, are you going to pay him off, too? He motioned at the brown-haired assassin. Actually, I have no objection to being paid off, said the brown-haired assassin. What? said the blonde. He seemed honestly shocked. This is just a freelance gig, the brown-haired one said. It's not one of my regular clients. I can just say others got here before I did and made it impossible to take the shot. Right, Sin said. And it's true, which makes it an even better story. Sin pointed to the blonde assassin, who was still incredulous. And that way, you don't have to try to kill him first to get to me. That's a good point, said the brown-haired assassin. Although now I guess I could charge you to kill him instead of just killing him for free. Sin turned to the blonde assassin. I'd rather just pay you not to kill me than to pay him to kill you, he said, because that's a felony. This assumes he's going to be able to kill me before I kill you, the blonde one said. Well, now it's two against one, the brown-haired assassin said. Hey, shut up, the blonde assassin said to the brown-haired assassin. You, you're an embarrassment. You take a job, you stick with a job. The brown-haired assassin shrugged. I just want to get paid, he said. The blonde looked at the brown-haired assassin like a bug, then turned to Sin. This golf game is really that important to you, he said. Oh, yes, Sin said. Yes. Please. The blonde assassin stared at Sin for a hard moment. Then he sighed. I want to register my strenuous objection to this situation, he said. Noted, Sin said, the gladness rising in his heart. He would be able to finish the round after all. Finish it and redeem his soul. The cost, whatever it was, would be cheap by comparison. This goes against everything I stand for as an ethical businessman, the blonde assassin said. However, given the situation, the blonde's exposition was drowned out by a loud bang and then halted when a sucking chest wound took away his capacity to speak. He collapsed. Sin whirled toward the brown-haired assassin as a second bang went off and caught that assassin in the act of flying backwards a grievous wound in his forehead. Sin continued to turn to see his caddy, conscious now, holding a large caliber handgun. What did you just do? Sin said. Judge Bufin Negan Sin, 
I strike a blow for the racial purity of the earth, the caddy said, and leveled his gun at Sin. For great justice! Sin bellowed and struck the caddy in the temple with the three wood. The caddy collapsed, arm falling sideways across his body as his hand reflexively pulled the trigger. The bullet entered the caddy's lung, pulping it, before blowing out the ninth thoracic vertebrae, killing the man instantly. Judge Sin stood there for several minutes, three wood at ready, just in case anyone else suddenly reanimated. Eventually, Sin became aware of someone speaking to him. He looked up and saw a foursome of golfers standing at the edge of the tee. What? Sin said. Jesus Christ, said one of the golfers. What the hell is going on here? What does it look like? Sin said. I'm playing golf. And with that, he turned, dug through his bag for a new ball and tee, found the spot that was not covered by blood or a dead body, and while the new foursome watched, disbelieving, set the tee and lined up his shot. He swung. The ball shanked hard to the left, disappearing forever into the woods. Crap! Sin said and collapsed into the grass.